Are you ready? Oh. It's time. Coast to coast, we're here and we represent them. Some join the foundation. We're about to jump right in it. Everybody is wrong. HBCUs, let's go. Tradition, transcend. Let's do it for the cultural. HBCU Ubiquity. Welcome to HBCU Ubiquity. I'm your host, Thomas Joyner Jr. Question. If you were an undergraduate at an HBCU, what was your favorite piece of art on the campus? Was it in the library, or the student center, or the chapel? For me, I don't want to offend anybody listening to this, but as an undergraduate at Howard University, HU, I was always most impressed with the Alpha Kappa Alpha stained glass windows in Rankin Chapel. Now for me, that says a lot because Howard had, and probably has more today, some extremely wonderful and impressive works of art. So thank you for listening on today because I want to talk about the art legacy of HBCUs, a topic that I feel does not receive enough discussion. Now we'll have conversations about the local and national political impact of HBCUs, HBCU contributions to medicine, sciences, law and business, but we don't give enough recognition to the art legacy of our schools. In this episode, we'll talk with Mr. Ted Ellis, longtime friend of the Tom Jordan Foundation and world-renowned artist. I mean, after all, if you're listening to this podcast right now, Chances are that you've probably seen his work before, whether you knew it or not, that you are viewing a Ted Ellis piece. Now, Ted's a Dillard alum, and he's currently working on a PhD at SUNO, which stands for Southern University of New Orleans. And he'll discuss with us the history and the significance of the HBCU art legacy, HBCU artists, collections, and pieces of significance. Next, we'll revisit an earlier conversation that we had with another longtime friend of the Tom Jordan Foundation, Dr. Billy Hawkins of Talladega College. Now, Talladega is home to some of the most famous and valuable HBCU art ever to exist, the Amistad murals. And if you don't know about those murals, then keep listening to this episode. I mean, after all, there's no telling what you'll learn from these conversations. The start of the next semester is almost here, and you can make a donation of any amount towards student scholarships to the HBCU of your choice. Please go to www.tomjoinerfoundation.org and make a donation today to keep a student enrolled at an HBCU. And also, don't forget to check us out on social media, H-B-C-U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-Y. HBC Ubiquity on IG, Facebook, and Twitter. Now, with that said, let's get started. Welcome to HBC Ubiquity. Hey! Before we get back to the HBC Ubiquity podcast, let's take a look at some Tom Jordan Foundation fundraising highlights. Here's an example of TJF's success. Hi, my name is Chelsea Luckett, a sophomore biology pre-nursing major at Tiffany College from Jackson, Mississippi. I would like to thank the Dallas Alumni Chapter and the Tom Jordan Foundation for the honor of receiving this scholarship, which will assist me in obtaining my Bachelor of Science and Nursing degree. Upon completing my degree, I plan to serve my community as a pediatric registered nurse. Thank you. To donate to the Tom Jordan Foundation, just log on to www.tomjordanfoundation.org and you can help a student continue their education at a HBCU. Welcome back to HBC Ubiquity. I'm joined now by a good friend of the Tom Jordan Foundation and, frankly, an artist extraordinaire, Mr. Ted Ellis. Good morning, Ted. How's it going today? Thomas, it's excellent. It's a wonderful day to um, serve the purpose and the inten- intentionality of, of, of education, the importance of it. My man. So let's get started like this. Why would you say that the arts are so important to the past and present and future, that is, of HBCUs? Well, if if you're talking about the preservation of culture and history, the iconography of, 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 of religion, customs and traditions, then art is extremely important. I mean, it's visual literacy. So when you're talking about, you know, land grant institution based on culture and, um, agricultural economy, then you think about the, the, the folks who developed those institutions and, and what gave them the, um, the purpose, um, the intent to, to want to have that. And um, a, a lot of it was, um, was the value was placed on, on their identity. And so when you look at, you know, universities, um, North Carolina A&T, Dillard University, this, you know, they have huge African collections. 
and that evolved into African-American art collections. And it's all about history and all about culture. And speaking of those schools and more, what are some of your favorite, you know, pieces in the collections of HBCUs? Well, you know, uh, you know, being a product of Dillard University, um, you know, uh, spending much time, much of my time in the library. We had a wonderful mural there that um, Hal Woodruff um, created. Uh, you know, Talladega just restored several of the murals, published a wonderful book of his artwork. Um, I think about, you know, in the 1940s when Elizabeth Catlett was teaching, she was in charge of the art department at Dillard University. She went and pro, uh, protest um, the museum, the Delgado Museum, which is now the New Orleans um, uh, Museum, uh, so that African-Americans could attend. She took a whole student body uh, from the school from Dillard um, over there. So, um, you know, that's... Um, th that's one of the artists, um, Artist Lane, is, a, is, a, is an artist that I like. Um, um, she did the um, portrait of, of Samuel Du Bois Cook, who was president of Dillard University. And so I had a chance to see that her, her portraiture work, um, had a chance to talk with um, Dr. Cook on multiple occasions about art and education and, and why he um, had an interest in supporting the visual arts. And Ted, as long as I've known you, you've been a proud Dillard alum, as, no, as, as, as we hear today. What made your experience at Dillard so memorable, and how else did it shape you as an artist? Well, you know, like every other um, African-American institution of, of higher learning, um, you know, it was definitely purpose-driven. It was about getting um, members of the African community um, ready for the future. Um, my professors were very intentional about that, about preparation, um, you know, having, having a solid um, educational foundation, finding your interest and your purpose. You know, I went to Dillard, I majored in chemistry, worked as an environmental chemist for... Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, for, for eight years, but I've always had the passion for art. So I would engage the professors in, 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 in history. I would frequently, during lunchtime, go over to the art department and speak with Ms. Nelson and some of the art students. I uh, told her that I was a, um, an artist, and um, I wound up having an art show at the library at Dillard University. And, uh, you know, what, they, what, what those institutions do, they give you the, uh, the nutrition, the, the fuel, um, the desire to, 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 to live a, a purpose, passion life, to do good with your passion and, uh, and, 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 and having an environment of others who look like me, you know, at the learned level, those who, who were teaching me, having a real interest in, 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 in my history and in my environment was critically important. Um, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm in school again, 21 years later, um, pursuing my master's in museum studies at Southern University of New Orleans. And, and that environment is a priceless environment when you know that your professors and, and instructors um, truly care about your well-being. Ted, are there any other examples of HBCUs with legacies and fine arts? And if so, who? Yeah, uh, there are a plethora of them. Um, North Carolina a and you know, Dr. Willie Hooker, who taught at Dillard University, I forget the young professor who came over there and helped revise the program. They have a robust program now that's tied to, to technology. Um, the students are enthused and energetic. You have uh, Fisk University that Aaron Douglas, who's the father of, of African-American art, who primarily spearheaded the Harlem Renaissance movement. He started the um, art department at Fisk. Um, Fisk um, has one of the largest collections of art then you got to think about Hampton University. You know, mm -hmm. Hampton is the first African-American museum in the country, in the United States. Your artifacts from Africa, West Africa, from Ghana, up until your, um, you know, your contemporary artists like Henry Oswald Tanner. Mm -hmm. Ted, are there any uh, emerging artists from HBCUs that you're excited about right now? Yeah, there, there are a couple. Um, you know, one I just recently met, um, Cicely... Um, Miller out of Dallas. I met her at the um, Dallas African American Museum. I looked at her work. Um, her work was very vibrant, very intentional. Um, it had social commentary. It spoke of social, social, social injustice, and and I marveled about her 
her um, her commitment. You know, she's a full time artist. You know, she majored in art, majored in communications at Xavier University. And for a female, she she reminds me right now, you know, of a young Margaret Burroughs, um, a Samela Lewis these institutional builders, um, these legacy builders. And, and, and that's what I came away with um, with my visit um, the, the last couple of weeks at, at the um, African American Museum in Dallas. There's a young man, Nathaniel um, Denot, um, who graduated from Texas Southern University. Um, he has worked as a full-time artist um, for several years, and he just um, got an opportunity to to be a student uh, and pursuing his master's at Yale University. Uh, that's 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 mm, uh, wow. so 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 the sustainability, the commitment. Um, I know Nathaniel personally um, in the Houston market and what he has done for other artists and his programming. You know, and, and I think about um, you know the. Um, the responsibility and the motivation through HBCUs that 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 becomes that driver, you know, it, it, it stays with you. Um, on the flip side, those are two students, but I want to talk about two professors, and okay. you know, um, you know, uh, Willie Hooker at North Carolina AT and T, who has who has worked hard and vigorous in keeping that program together and doing wonderful things um, in, the, in the Greensboro area. And also um, Dr. Clarence Talley at um, Prairie View a and hmm. very deliberate and very intentional, um, who's involved with professors who, who, who teach at historically black colleges and university. And, and they take on social commentary through art. They put on exhibitions, um, workshops, and, 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 and conventions throughout the year. And so, it has created a academic platform for the purpose of, of pushing culture forward through the uh, this this visual commentary. So um, you know, um, um, very very robust, um, but we still have some challenges in seeing the the the, the power and the urgency of, of of taking art to market in our communities and in our institutions. I'm glad you ended like that. I wanted to, I wanted to follow up with you on a similar note because you mentioned a few seconds ago HBCUs as a driver. And how did, or better yet, did Dillard or Southern known or Southern New Orleans prepare you for the business side of art? And if so, how? Yeah, I, I, I can say yes um, to that. So you know, being a chemist, you know, it's it's very analytical. You have to um, observe make an assessment and, and come up with a conclusion. So so the critical thinking, that preparation, along with the creative thinking, provides an opportunity to, to, to make an assessment and come up with a strategic plan. And, um, you know, you, you have your level of core competency of courses, but you can take a few other courses like, you know, economics. Um, um, you think about, I mean, since, since, since my discipline has come out of chemistry, it has always been one of an analytical, of, of observation. Um, the, um, the critical thinking, um, uh, that piece is an important piece. The creative side of that, you know, being involved in the art, you know, you, 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 you're sort of doing a critical thing as well. You have to figure the composition out you have to figure the tone, tonality of the painting, um, the temperature, and, and the mood. Mm. Um, you know, so you, you blend those two things and you think about, you know, taking culture to market. And when you make that assessment, then if, you, if, you, if you're at the library and you want to know something about the Renaissance, then you go and you find your book about the Renaissance. And so I did. I mean, I would study. I would, you know, um, self-teach myself, learn as much as I could. And, and the more information I, um, I digested, you know, I realized that France whole gross national product is on celebrating culture. You know, when the Rhine River was flooding, they didn't say save the people. They say save the art. But I, I do know that during the 14th century, the Medici and Medici, who, who funded all of, all of Europe, had a high propensity for architect and mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. I know three centuries later, you had the advent of Sotheby's, Christie's, Philip the Perry auction house. That's headquartered in the United States does conservatively about thirty billion dollars in cultural assets, and so I says, well, you know, there's 
this big business surrounded around art and culture. And so if you look at all the major epic centers in the United States, Washington, D.C., New York, you can use Boston, um, Los Angeles, Miami, Houston, um, those epic centers have major museums. You know, typically they have federal participation, 50 to 70 percent federally. Um, the back end of that are major corporations and foundations that support the infrastructure of these cultural institutions that never go out of business. They're pretty much re re uh, recession proof and inflation proof. So I think about that model and I think about what our institutions ought to be involved in. It needs to be a high priority on, on leveraging culture and taking culture to market. The culture economy, uh, it's, it's, it's so important. It is a driver. Um, we look at policies and laws. They're, they're culturally centered and based. Um, culture is big business, and, and we need to be entrenched in that. In other words, the game is to be sold, not told. That's it. That's it, Tom. Uh, you, know, you know, Ted, I want to change the subject on you slightly, and uh, sorry to put you on the spot here right quick, but you've been on a couple of our cruises before. What can you tell listeners of this podcast about the Tom Joyner Foundation Fantastic Voyage Cruise? Wow. So, for the folks who haven't been, it is the ninth wonder of the world. <laughs> Thank you, brother. It is. No, no it, it, it is. My, my first cruise, I was 24 hours up. Um, the, um, the camaraderie, the, uh, the love... The intentionality of, of an institution on both sides, um, um, you know, Reach Media, the foundation, is about pushing culture forward and, um, and having that love and support for the intentionality of our future is exceptional. Uh, you know, I mentioned that on the cruise this time when I had an opportunity to, to mm -hmm. speak to some of the folks, but, but we have not had that level of commitment from our community in a sustainable way it's 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 been it's been only a, a part but to have that level of commitment uh for 20 plus years is incredulous we need to celebrate that we need to commemorate that we need to recognize that and we need to look at the best practice of that so that we could magnify that effort you're talking about sowing the seed into our future providing scholarships for our our future our children we have to continue to give um i've seen um even when, 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 when the corporate support was not there for the foundation, the foundation still pushed forward with excellence to, to, to provide an, uh, an opportunity for those in need. I, I think the folks who, who get on that cruise and, 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 and put their hard-earned dollars in there you know, for the future, there's no shortcomings on this cruise. You get 100% participation from the entertainers. The entertainers are dining with the folks um, out there, you know, in the um, in the dining area. They're meeting and greeting. I mean, you know, it's it's like an adult kid in a candy store. You know, you get to have, you know, every flavor, every treat. It's it it's remarkable, man. Um, you know, your dad um, early in the morning, late at night, meeting and greeting folks, man. Uh, watching you and Oscar do the same thing with your family and the friends and stuff. And then the commitment from all the celebrities and folks, you know, uh, you know, pouring in because we know that you, we know what the outcome is. So when when that student graduates from from Morehouse, from 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 Hampton, from Talladega, from Dillard, from Suno with that degree and then gets that opportunity to get that master, you know, then step out here in, in, in the corporate world and and, and of VPs and presidents of of of, of Merck Pharmaceutical and Exxon Mobil, then then we done what we're supposed to do with being responsible. On the other side of that, you have a good time. You yeah. know what I mean, you, 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 you're totally entertained. You're totally, you, you, you're nourished culturally. Um, you're stimulated politically uh, with the commentary. Everything is driven with purpose on the cruise. Um, I thank you for, for giving me opportunity, giving my family opportunity, my friends, my fellow artists to come in and, and be involved for doing the right thing. Well, Ted Ellis, thank you for your time and your uh, your insight today. We really appreciate this. And while you're in Austin, please give our love and regards to our lady friends at The Links. We'll, we'll do, Thomas. Thank you so much.
Let's take a quick break and learn about one of the Tom Jordan Foundation scholarship programs that helps students at historic black colleges and universities. Here's an example of the Tom Jordan Foundation's success. Hi, my name is Sedonia Sheree Thomas, a freshman biology major from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I am extremely honored and grateful to receive this scholarship as I pursue my studies at Tuflu College. I would like to personally thank the Washington, D.C. alumni chapter, the Tom Jordan Foundation, and my parents, Milo and Jacqueline Thomas. To donate to the Tom Jordan Foundation, just log on to www.tomjordanfoundation.org and you can help a student continue their education at a HBCU. Welcome back to HBCU Ubiquity. This is Thomas Joyner Jr. and I'm joined by the president of Talladega College, Dr. Billy Hawkins. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate you being here. Thanks for having us on your show. Appreciate uh, the invite. Dr. Hawkins, for the education of our listeners, can you explain just briefly, or as much time as you need, what the Amistad murals are and their significance? Well, the significance is that, um, uh, you know, back in 1938, um, um, then President Gallagher, um, in, in, in celebration of the 75th uh, anniversary of the uh, Amistad slave revolt, um, uh, had asked uh, Hale Woodruff, who is a, uh, a, a, a famous um, uh, um, artist, and I say that uh, he's one of the greatest artists uh, to ever live, not African-American artists. He is African-American. But he's one of the greatest artists to ever walk on this earth. Yep. And so at that time, Hale Woodruff was teaching at, the, at at Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University, down the AU Center, in the art department. He may have been chair there. And, and so, but he taught at Talladega part time. So he used to drive each week up to Talladega to teach in our art department. And then President had, had, had asked him to. Uh, to paint um, the, uh, the the three Amistad murals. And so that's how the conversation started. Uh, Hell would have at the time he said to the president, I don't know how to paint murals. You know, I, you know, I know how to paint small paintings, but you're asking me to take on a, a, a monumentous, uh, monumental task. Now, these murals would, would be placed in uh, the new library that they, that was being constructed at the time. <clears throat> and so what happened is that he ended up going to uh, to Mexico uh, and, 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 and the president supported him uh, to study under uh, Diego Rivera, wow. who's one, one of the most famous muralists in the world. And he spent about six months there. And so that's where he went there. And then he subsequently went to Yale uh, uh, University because Yale owned the uh, the, the archives of the uh, Amistad. And so he went and studied all that. And then he came back and then he started painting. <clears throat> the first three, uh, the Amistad, they were finished in right, 19, um, right around 1937, 38. And, and, um, and then they... Um, place those in the in the lobby of a library and then he also uh painted three additional uh, murals which were completed around right around 1942. Uh, by that time hill woodruff had moved on to nyu where he had a career of 21 years there but when he finished those murals uh in his lab over in atlanta sent those back to the institution and of course they uh, were placed um, on the other side of our of our foyer uh, in, in the library. So that's how the those murals um, on canvas. That's how they got here. Um, but still, from 1938 to when I arrived here um, uh, in 2008, um, those murals had never been appraised. Nor you know, over the years, folks would come to Talladega. They'd go to the library and they'd, they'd see these beautiful murals, uh, but 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 there was no value. And so when I got here in 2008, I asked the board about the murals. You know, I clearly saw that they were very very colorful, mm. 
And um, we brought a mirrorless, uh, we, we brought a appraisal company in from New York with, that we raised the money to bring them in. And they spent a week on campus, they appraised the Amistad murals, and, and they, they appraised all six in the week. Um, they came in to give me the report on, on what they felt the value of those paintings uh, were. And uh, he said, that I've got good news and I've got bad news. <laughs> the good news is, is that the three Amistad murals are worth, uh, they're worth $20 million. And the other three, which is the underground, one is of the Underground Railroad, uh, the, the uh, first day of class here at, at, at Talladega, and the other one is the construction of the library that they that they hung in for over 73 years. He said that was a good, and, and those three, because of painted by, of course, by the same, same artists, are worth $20 million as well. So here we got a $40 million asset in the library. Probably, th- if you probably shake the door, uh, enough, hard enough, you probably would be able to go right in there and just mm-hmm. know the value. Of course, we had to scramble to get insurance put on on, on the murals. And then, um, um, but that was good. The bad news, they told me, was that these murals are three years away from disintegrating. Wow. They had, they had, they had dried out. And he said, if you don't get them restored within three years, you're going to lose $40 million. And of course, Tom, at that time, we didn't have very much money when I got here. And so I began to look for someone to partner with. And, and the High Museum in Atlanta uh, ended up partnering with us, help us to raise the $200,000 to get the murals restored in their laboratory in Atlanta. And then from there, they went on a national tour for about a year, <clears throat> about a year and a half. Uh, and, um, um, and while they were in New York on tour, the appraisal company went back over and did a reappraisal for us uh, and um, um, and called and told me that uh, uh, that, that the, because they had been cleaned and restored, the value had increased by another uh, $10 million. Wow. And so, so we had a $50 million asset there. And, and uh, so it's going to be exciting uh, to um, and love to have you all to come and, and be a part of that next year because that museum, um, you know, I go in those buildings almost every day just checking to see how they're coming along. And and um, it's going to be about a 10,000 square, uh, square feet um, museum and in, in the, uh, two galleries. Um, uh, we have a, a boardroom in there and a very nice classroom, social area. It's going to be a real nice uh, facility. It's not every day, it's not every year that a $200,000 investment automatically flips into a $10 million uh, value. Congratulations yeah. on that. And, and yes, I, I would love to be there for that next year. I've been hearing a lot about them, and I know, know a lot about them, of course, with our, exec- our executive director, Barbara Harrington. So yes. I look forward to being there for that, Dr. Hawkins. Well, that, that, that's, that's great. It should be. It's just, you know, it's going to be a, a grand celebration to... Uh, to finally uh, put those murals uh, uh, in a facility that they'll, they'll be there for another 151 years plus. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hawkins, thank you again for your time, for your candor, and for your patience with us. I appreciate all that you shared with us today. Well, thank you, Tom, for having me on, on your you know on your on your show. You know, anytime. You know, we uh, we love to talk about uh, Talladega College, uh, this great institution, and. You know, and you know, we've been here now 11 years and, and really have had uh, um, uh, a great run here at Talladega and just looking forward to uh, continuing to grow, grow the institution. You know, we're up over 1,200 students this past fall and and uh, a long ways from a, from 280 students when I first got here. Yes, in, wow. In 2008. And so we're just really pleased with that growth. And, and I also should mention, too, that we started our first master's program this past fall in computer science, and so oh wow! So we're you know so we're in the graduate school business now, and, and uh, so that's that's been an exciting time, you know, for the institution. We love talking about our HBCUs. You know, our schools do do you know great job in and and working with our students, and and our schools represent uh, higher education uh, very well um, uh, in this country. Well, congratulations to you and all that you've accomplished at Talladega College. And yes, I'll be taking you up on that invitation as well. I will be back in touch to talk more with you for upcoming episodes of HBC Ubiquity. All right. Take care. 
Let's take a quick break and learn about one of the Tom Jordan Foundation scholarship programs that helps students at historic black colleges and universities. Here's an example of the Tom Jordan Foundation's success. Hi, my name is Sonia Fry. I'm a senior business major from Detroit, Michigan. I would like to thank this university and the Tom Joyner Foundation for the scholarship. Upon completing my degree, I plan to hit the ground running to get into the music industry. Thank you so much, Tom Joyner Foundation. I really appreciate it. To donate to the Tom Joyner Foundation, just log on to www.tomjoynerfoundation.org and you can help a student continue their education at a HBCU. Welcome back to HBC Ubiquity, and thank you for listening to this week's episode about the art legacy of HBCUs. As you heard, the Tom Jordan Foundation has partnered with Ted Ellis for years on board the Tom Jordan Foundation Fantastic Voyage Cruise. And some of the proceeds from the sale of the art from artists like Ted have gone towards scholarships for HBCU students that are majoring in fine arts. Oh, and with that said, I want to shout out some of the other artists that have partnered with us over the years due to their love and support of HBCUs. Artists like Frank Frazier, Charles Bibbs, Cynthia St. James, Leroy Campbell, Loban Hamilton, and of course the late great Miss Annie Lee. As I said at the beginning of this episode, scholarship support is needed, whether for tuition, books, or other fees. At TomJordanFoundation.org backslash donate, you can donate to the HBC of your choice, and you can rest assured that our students will make your donation of any amount work towards the completion of their degree. Just go to TomJordanFoundation.org backslash donate and help out a student at Howard, or at Hampton, or at Spelman, or at Morris Brown, or at Bluefield State. Any HBCU, and you can find them all listed on the drop-down menu and the donation page and make your selection. Thank you for listening to this week's Conversation with a Purpose, and please come back next week for another episode of HBCU Ubiquity. HBCU.